Photography Daily. Today, American photojournalist Nancy Borowick. I always loved photography, but I didn't actually think I could make a career out of it. And I didn't quite know who I was as a photographer. I was just, I enjoyed making pictures, taking pictures, connecting with people, using my camera. We talk about the power of the still image. My photographs made a difference in the lives of these kids in the school and how, how special. And then how Nancy's world and that of her parents changed dramatically in 2012. My parents called and said, hey, like we're coming into New York City. Where do you want? Let's have dinner. And so I got us a table at my favorite restaurant. You know, I was so excited. And, and we got to, to the dinner um, and I knew something wasn't right. The news her parents brought was that both of them had cancer, but they wanted to record this journey of treatment together with Nancy as their documenter. I think I was so lost in the news that I wasn't even thinking about that. And suddenly I had a purpose. Mm. I was like, okay, yeah, of course I'll tell your story or I'll, of course I'll be that platform for you to tell your story. And that's what that's really what kicked off the family imprint as we know it now, which is the story of of my family uh, as my parents were in treatment. And so began the most incredible personal photo account. It was interesting to see the dynamic change because in some ways my mother was the expert (laughs) and my father was the newbie. She had had cancer on and off for 18 years and he was, you know, just diagnosed and there were a lot of moments of humor. We talk often about how a camera can detach a photographer from the reality of what is before their eyes. A kind of coping mechanism. And suddenly when I took that picture, I wasn't thinking these are my parents sitting, having chemotherapy drugs pumped through their body. I was thinking that the symmetry was interesting. But this isn't a project about loss. It's a far deeper retrospective about life. The story that I was telling and the story that I was um, documenting was the story we were living, which wasn't about cancer. It was about making the most of the time that we had left not knowing how much. We learn about the gift making pictures gives us. There were so many funny things that happened and I get to hold on to that. I get to keep that forever. Yeah. Which is what I love about photography and, and, and really all mediums that where you can capture information permanently. Because, you know, once the moment's gone, the moment's gone. And then in the midst of this, new beginnings as Nancy gets married. I'm assigned to this story, but this is your story and you need to tell it. So how are you going to shoot your own wedding? And we talk about the human angle of this very personal, whilst very public story that's now been featured by magazines and news outlets across the globe, won many awards and even encouraged former presidents to write after seeing Nancy Borowick's photo essay. There were moments um, early on where I felt like, what if I'm going to miss something important? What if I'm so close to my story, so close to this story that I'm not going to see something that's important and relevant? You know, thinking like a photographer. Stories of life told by photographers. And today, that photographer is... Nancy Borowick. I think hearing is the last thing that goes, and I think she probably felt comfort hearing us say, yeah, we're okay. Supported as ever by MPB.com for buying and selling and trading used camera gear in the UK, the US and Europe. Quality used gear is a way of driving the, the circular economy, and of course this makes it a sustainable way to shop too. Each year, and I know I've quoted this figure before, but every time I look at it I think, wow, why doesn't everybody do it this way? MPB saved 1,200 football pitches worth of plastic bubble wrap by using recycled packaging. And just prior to Christmas, actually, MPB partnered with One Tree Planted to plant trees every time somebody used the platform to buy, sell or trade their camera gear. This meant that MPB customers helped to plant over 20,000 trees. As a global platform, MPB is proud to support reforestation projects in several regions around the world. And we're proud to have them as a sponsor to this show. Patron of the day, David Tanner, whose Instagram grid at a lens in the landscape, I'll link to it as always, is a study of life. The light cast by a standard lamp at home of an evening. A pin badge of a man called Frank. Still life, moving barley fields, spiders webs in the rain. Wonderful stuff. And uh, yes, the link is uh, within the show notes today. Patrons get a chance, of course, to spread the word to thousands of listeners. And, of course, uh, hear our Tuesday and Thursday Patreon channel, where tomorrow the price I've personally paid over the last seven days for what I shall call a social media mistake. 
So, Nancy Borowick, our guest today. I'm so privileged that Nancy agreed to tell her family story, as this for me is the ultimate reminder of what gift we can give as photographers, back to those we photograph, those we love, and actually also to ourselves. The Family Imprint is a a story, a book about Nancy's parents, Howie and Laurel, married for over three decades as they're treated for cancer together, often in the same room taking chemo. The book shows everything from to-do lists to greetings cards to saved love letters to the, the most empathic black and white photographs of this incredibly potent life and love story. It's influenced many others to photograph and tell their stories, and even moved one former president to write, Dear Nancy, I wanted to write and tell you how moved I was by your wonderful photo essay about your parents. The strength you've shown throughout this project is remarkable and a true inspiration to all those struggling with illness and loss. Signed, William Jefferson Clinton. It's not a subject people instantly feel at ease with, I know. In many cultures, such photographic projects might be deemed inappropriate or too private, maybe. These are all comments that Nancy's face, though. And when you see her work and hear how and why it was made, I believe you'll understand exactly why the family imprint has captured the hearts of readers worldwide, earning a a World Press Photo Award in 2016 and a Humanitarian Award two years later. Meet storyteller Nancy Borowick. Nancy, your your interest in storytelling is a proper sort of one one that starts from youth. You, I mean, you were as you freely admit to, you were a proper storyteller as a child, weren't you? This is the truth. Um, I remember talking to my parents about this, and uh, as a kid, I was um, very curious. I went up to strangers <laughs> to ask them questions. I had no no fear and no boundaries, um, which I now as a storyteller professionally, I I look back fondly on that because clearly it was meant to be. Um, But I also learned that when I was a a child in school, I had gained a reputation as being a bit of a a tattletale (laughs) um, because I loved people's stories, but I also believed deeply in justice and fairness. So if something wasn't fair or just, I... I would tell the teacher. (laughs) But then you did study photojournalism at school, so you used that skill well. Um, And I don't want to fast forward too much toward what we're going to talk about today, but I am interested to know a sort of plotted history of how that happened. Yeah, sure. Um, So I always loved photography, but I didn't actually think I could make a career out of it. And I didn't quite know who I was as a photographer. I was just, I enjoyed making pictures, taking pictures, connecting with people, using my camera. Um, After college, I was an intern at um, Glamour magazine in New York City in their photo department, which was a great opportunity to learn about the business, uh, the publication business a bit. Um, But I also learned something even more valuable, which was that I didn't want to be in that part of the business. I wanted to be the storyteller. And, you know, I was young and naive and idealistic and had big dreams. So fast forward, I left that internship. I found an opportunity teaching photography uh, in rural Ghana. And when I came back from that experience, um, I had just been so impacted and moved by the people I met and the lessons I learned and wanted to give back to the school where I'd been teaching. And I figured, well, maybe I can do something with my photography. So fast forward a few months, I pulled some strings, spoke to some people, and I decided to put together a really, really simple exhibition. Like I printed the pictures myself and I bought these like really simple matted frames and I taped them to a wall. This this gallery allowed me to use their space in between exhibitions for two days and invited everyone I knew and said, I'm looking to sell these images to raise money, to build a well at the school where I was teaching. If I, I needed to give back in some way, even though I felt like nothing could really equate to what what I feel like I gained from being there with the school. Long story short, uh, it took about two years, but I raised about $11,000 and we were able to build this well at the school. And over the course of this time, I realized, you know, wow, like my photographs, I look back now and I don't think they're particularly good aesthetically, but uh, my photographs were able to not only teach people about the, the access to water, um, clean water 
issue in this village, but it became a catalyst to actually bring change and create this. Well, like my photographs made a difference in the lives of these kids in the school and how, how special, and I want to do it again. <laughs> you know, like I need, this is who I am and this is what drives me. I want to do work that is meaningful and impactful. So that was the I reason, that yeah. was the reason really you became a photojournalist and that you thought, well, if my pictures can make that much of a difference for me, what can I do for other people with them? Well, and that's, that is exactly it. That in that moment, I was like, and now I understand photojournalism in a new way. Yeah. Uh, and this is who I want to be and what I want to do. But I felt like I felt kind of ill-equipped. I, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't, I was sort of floundering, taking jobs here and there. Once I got back to New York, um, kind of very lost. And, and then I ended up doing a one-year program, the one-year certificate program in documentary photography and photojournalism at the International Center of Photography. And then Newsday and New York Times. I mean, these aren't bad leg ups, are they, as it goes? <sighs> yes. So actually, I had had the opportunity at the end of my program to potentially meet an editor from the New York Times. We had this big career day and, I, and, and, and there was a line out the door waiting to meet with this editor from the New York Times. And I thought to myself, Obviously, I would like to connect with them, but I don't think I'm ready. And if this is my one shot, like if I only get one shot, I, I need to be ready. Yeah. There was this editor from Newsday who who didn't have a line. And I thought, OK, like, let's let's just chat. We got to chatting. We really liked each other. Um, she liked my work and said she would be in touch. And fast forward uh, a few months, I started freelancing for Newsday, doing all sorts of different types of assignments, learning how to be an assignment shooter for a real publication. And um, and that really set me up so that down the line, when the New York Times came back around, I I was prepared. So uh, today I want to talk about The Family Imprint, the, the, a, right. da a daughter story of love and loss. It's a beautiful book. Um, Thank sometimes you. A, 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 a beautiful, when we're talking about the subject of, of family loss, seems almost inappropriate. But I think if you if you could apply that word in, in this sense, then I think it's entirely accurate because it, it's, it's such a beautiful book. Um, Thank you. Now, where does it start? I mean, we've... We've talked about covering end-of-life stories, and for some people it's an issue that's very difficult to hear about or consume. But, you know, I, as photographers, I think we're blessed with this skill. You certainly are, the empathy the, and, and the reason to photograph what we see before us. And for you, this is this incredible story of your, your mother and father. But how does the story start? The story starts... Actually, it started while I was still a student at ICP. My mother had been in treatment for metastatic breast cancer uh, for the second time. And I coincidentally needed to find a project to work on while I was a student. So I thought, well, I can photograph my mother and that would allow me to spend more time with her. I had never done something so personal. And I, I, I felt like I, what I knew how to do was just be there and shoot. And, um, and she became very comfortable with me having my camera around. Fast forward two years, her... Her cancer had, um, she was in remission, but then it came back. It, it's a little unclear as the in-between time, but technically it was remission. But then it came back, you know, stage four everywhere. And I hadn't started photographing because I was still sort of processing what was happening um, when my father got his diagnosis, stage four pancreatic cancer. And that was out of the blue, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It was out of the blue. And I remember we actually, my parents called and said, hey, like we're coming into New York City. Where do you want? Let's have dinner. And so I got us a table at my favorite restaurant. You know, I was so excited. And, and we got to, to the dinner um, and I knew something wasn't right. They were acting a little strange. And my first thought was it, it must be my mother. She mu thinks must be worse than I worse than I realized. Yeah. And it turned out it was my father who said, I have stage four pancreatic cancer. It's inoperable. Mm. Um, it's pretty much a death sentence. And and so in that moment, I realized, oh, my God, <laughs> you know, like I'm 20. I was like 27 at the time. Yeah. Um, and here are both my parents um, essentially dying. Yeah. Uh, and I had to figure out a way to make sense of that because my whole reality was suddenly shattered. Yeah. 
into a million pieces. <laughs> I mean, the incredible thing here is that you didn't, even though you've been photographing a, a little bit your mother, but, but uh, mm. when this happened, when this was put before you, it was actually your father, wasn't it, that, uh, that said, could you make this a story? It wasn't, it wasn't you, it was him. It was him, yeah. Well, I should tell you, my father was a storyteller. He was a he was a he was a, a trial lawyer, and okay. he cared deeply for his clients and really thrived in the courtroom. He was that uh, if you know the movie, he was sort of the main character in My Cousin Vinny, right. Vinny the the cousin who is this big shot or not big shot this lawyer from New York City, like yeah. thick Queens accent, like over it. the top I, dramatic. I, yeah, I know it. That was my father, and it didn't surprise me when he had asked my mother if. Uh, she thought I would photograph and tell his story. Um, and it was a no brainer. I think I was so lost in the news that I wasn't even thinking about that. And suddenly I had a purpose. Mm. I was like, okay, yeah, of course I'll tell your story. Or I'll, of course I'll be that platform for you to tell your story. And that's what, that's really what kicked off the family imprint as we know it now, which is the story of, of my family uh, as my parents were in treatment for cancer side by side and look and and my goal I think was just sort of to tell the tell our story as we were living it the way we were living it. Why do you think he asked you? Frankly, I actually think there was a little bit of envy that I had spent so much time with my mother <laughs> and telling her story and he kind of wanted um his moment it was his to five, tell his his 5 minutes of fame. Yeah, cuz he I mean, my mother was a bit more private and he really had to pull things out of her whereas my father was an open book. Yeah. So, you know, like, for example, I once sat down with a video camera because he wanted to do a, a, an interview with himself before he died. And he gave me a list of questions to ask. But as soon as I, you know, I asked one question and then he just spoke for three hours. Wow. He didn't even need me. He just he wanted to know someone was interested, I think. And, and I maybe in some ways, because of what I do, kind of extending that invitation um, and acknowledging him and his interest and supporting him in that way. I think it was therapeutic for him to really talk about his feeling. Like that's everyone, everyone is different. I am like my father in this way. I need to vocalize and talk about yeah. my feelings and my thoughts, everything out loud. <laughs> did did, did mum then become, uh, I mean, you say she was a bit, but she was more private. Did, yeah. um, I, I would assume in this side by side, and we'll come to this side by side um, thing in a moment, but, but, I would imagine now that they're they're both going through this together. It's a shared experience, not perhaps one that they wanted to share, but it's a shared experience. Mm -hmm. Did you find that she opened up more as well? Yeah, I did. You know, it's funny. I, I say she's more private, but it's also kind of in comparison to my father, who is oh, like right. yeah. so open. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, but yeah, as the as the weeks and months went on of them in treatment together and both living with uh, their illnesses side by side. Uh, it was interesting to see the dynamic change because in some ways my mother was the expert <laughs> and my yeah. father was the newbie. She yeah. had had cancer on and off for 18 years and he was, you know, just diagnosed. And there were a lot of moments of humor. I don't know how to describe it. Like these moments where my father felt particularly bad for himself or was having certain pains and would make the comment to my mother that like, you don't get it. And she would laugh and be like, are you kidding me? I, I get it. Like I've lived it for so much longer than you. Like this isn't a competition, but like if it was, <laughs> um, I have the experience. One of the signature images. Well, it's many signature images, but one one of the one of the images that I think is associated with this project perhaps more than any other it is one of those original pictures you you made. Um, you had to go back and take it twice, I think, didn't you? Because the lens wasn't wide enough on the first on the first occasion. <laughs> but, but it's 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 the one of your um of of mum and dad next to each other. Um, the, uh, did you call it mirroring or? I called it uh, his and hers chair his and or hers. his and hers yes. his and hers yes. Tell me about that picture. So I call it that because I, you know, how when someone gets married and they have like his and hers towels or, or I don't know, like I thought, you know, here they are going through this experience together and just how bizarre it was. But, you know, they had each other and this was just our reality. That photograph 
was one of my first and it became sort of one of the iconic images with the project, I think, because if you have to pick one image that tells the larger story, which often as a photojournalist, you know, you you try to get the whole story in one image as best as you can. That image always stood out to me uh, because to me, it, fe- it felt like it did tell the whole story. They, it told the story of the cancer. It told the story of the two of them in this together, supporting each other, but also dealing with their own illnesses in their own ways. My father, I think in the picture, he's kind of sort of falling asleep and my mother um, is sitting there going through the bills in the mail, kind of treating treating her her treatment and her cancer like another item on her to-do list, whereas my father was really struggling um, in his own way. Yeah. There was also this moment when I was sitting in the chemotherapy room with them when I realized that there was such interesting symmetry from my perspective. I noticed the symmetry. I noticed the light. Um, and that's, I think the photographer in yes, me that can't yeah. really, you can't really turn that part off. No. So I had to shoot it. And suddenly when I took that picture, I wasn't thinking these are my parents sitting, having chemotherapy drugs pumped through their body. Mm. I was thinking that the symmetry was interesting. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's a trick of the mind or if that's, a defense mechanism, but it, it worked. Well, I certainly think it's and, a, it's a yeah. detachment mechanism, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think without that detachment or in the way that I often refer to it as sort of compartmentalization, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think that's what allowed me to shoot this story mm. and to simultaneously survive mm. and function and and also advocate for them because it gave me a little bit of a distance from the reality that was happening, but and I was able to use a tool that had become second nature to me. It was comfortable. Yeah. And very comfortable. And and it was, I don't even think I realized what I was doing when I was doing it. I was just sort of going through the motions and it was helping. You do say that this story is, is also, it's not, it's not totally about disease. Uh, sure, that's happening. And it's a conduit to the piece, I know. But um, you say it's a it's a much deeper story because it's a love story. Yeah. And and that's important, yeah. isn't it? It's really important. Um, I I remember once someone asked me why I I didn't have as many images in my in the body of work where my parents were sick or in the hospital, and yeah. and maybe that was a subconscious thing on my part that I wasn't including them. But to be honest, the the story cancer is what brought us to the situation there are diagnoses uh but the story that i was telling and the story that i was um documenting was the story we were living which wasn't about cancer it was about making the most of the time that we had left not knowing how much I didn't have the courage to make pictures of my mother years ago when she dealt with her end of life illness. And I wasn't a photographer when my father passed. But I I wonder now if having talked to photographers like yourself, I wonder now whether I'd have seen how important this, this could have been. Are you ever asked by people how to go about doing this? Do they say, Nancy, tell me how to do this? All the time. People ask me all the time. A lot of photographers have said I couldn't have done this. Yeah. the way that you did. And I say, well, I couldn't have either. I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I didn't, I think that I was sort of in the right place at the right time. I had been working professionally. I was comfortable with my camera and, and being in uncomfortable situations. And I wasn't, I wasn't intentionally telling this story. I was just in it and, and reacting to what was happening. When people do ask, uh, for example, a friend of a friend. I get a lot of friends of friends yes, yeah. contacting me yeah. saying they thought this would be okay. And and I welcome all contact because I feel like once, like you, once you've lived through this kind of loss, you, you sort of have this wealth of knowledge and experience that um, you can really help other people going through what they're going through. And uh, so a friend of a friend contacted me and said, my mother is dying and I'm trying to process this. And I, I'm terrified and, and of all these things. I don't know how many days we have left, but I'm not a photographer. I'm not a writer. How do I hold on to her? 
And, you know, I wasn't prepared for that, but I was just sort of speaking from the heart. And I said, I said, one, I'm really, I'm grateful that you did think of about this component, you know, like that you want to do something because the reality is, is that once someone's gone, someone's gone mm-hmm. and the stories are gone and their voice is gone and all those things as difficult as it, as that is. So I said, you know what, my advice would be, you know, you have your phone with you, just start recording, just start recording your conversations. Right. Um, make notes. I hate the way that I write. So I just made bullet point notes because I wanted to remember the funny, you know, off kilter things that happened. I wanted to remember those moments where, um, you know, like talking to the nurse about like, does my mother really like the funny, weird jokes that happen or, or the fact that um, uh, the fact that I'm pretty sure my grandmother was trying to set my friends up with other people, like at my, at my parents shivas like the the funny those little things like yeah. i was like just record yeah don't think about it just record um and she was like she felt a little awkward about it but then she was like you know what i'm gonna do it and then i heard from her months later and she said you know my mom passed away and i'm so grateful that you that you brought that to my attention because i did record and while she wasn't entirely in her in her right mind during that time there were so many funny things that happened and I get to hold on to that. I get to keep that forever, yeah, yeah. which is what I love about photography and, and, and really all mediums that where you can capture information permanently because, you know, once the moment's gone, the moment's gone. I don't know. The other thing is that I'm, I'm a bit of a hoarder. <laughs> I'm a collector. <laughs> I, I desperately want to hold on to all the things I possibly can. And, um, do you know, I've heard photography described as many, <laughs> or photographers as described as many things, but yeah, maybe we are. I've never heard it. I thought of it that way. <laughs> maybe we are subconsciously hoarders. It's just we're hoarders of imagery. We're hoarders of imagery and we have a tool to well, do that hoarding, well, yeah. you know, like we. And we have an excuse. Well, it's okay. I'm hoarding imagery. <laughs> and we have we have obsession, but that's yeah. part of who we are. And that's part well, of. You're allowed like, it. it you as, know, a, as a photographer. Catering. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds like the perfect excuse. Um, so you're, yeah. you're making this incredibly potent, very vulnerable story. And and then the New York Times say they'd like to carry it. Now, um, you're, you're sharing this sort of very personal family story. You're, you're making a personal family story for yourself initially. It's not because you're thinking, well, I'm going to make a book out of this. Or uh, I know your father was very pleased to, to, to offer up his stories. But I'm, I, I shouldn't think that a publication was the forefront of your mind. Did your parents mind that or did they welcome that? I think they were, I know that they were surprised at the prospect of their very personal um, story becoming very public. But they said to me that if this was important to me and my career, then if this was a gift that they could give me kind of at this point, um, then what did they have to lose? Yeah. And what? Did, and look at what they had to gain. And I don't think any of us could have predicted or imagined um, the reaction and how much we would get back uh, as a result of sharing our personal story. That was, that was really overwhelming. And I'm grateful that my parents got to experience some of that kind of reader engagement um, before they died. Another thing that your mother and father got to experience was your marriage. I like the story of you climbing the tree to, to do some sort of marriage selfie, you had to become your own wedding photographer. Well, I, when we were planning the wedding, people, the first thing people would ask me was, who is going to shoot your wedding? And are you going to take pictures? Um, I think they all expected me to say, you know, like I've hired someone I'm not going to shoot, but yeah. they clearly, those those people clearly didn't know me well enough. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think sometimes as photographers, we have a difficulty uh, relinquishing control and letting go. I feel most present when I am taking pictures. So, you know, those moments when like people are like, you know, why don't you just put your camera down and be in the moment? I'm like, I am in the moment. This is what helps me be in the moment. <laughs> Sometimes only photographers can understand I think so. and relate to that. I do. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so when it came to the wedding, I had been talking with the New York times and this seemed like a perfect sort of climax for the story. Uh, for the sake of the paper. And um, Jim Estrin, uh, who is a longtime staff photographer there, and he used to run the Lens blog, He's and has since become a mentor of mine. 
uh, was assigned actually to go to my wedding to shoot it for the paper, for the larger story. And I remember he said to me, I'm assigned to this story, but this is your story and you need to tell it. So how are you going to shoot your own wedding? <laughs> and I was like, okay, uh, let's think about this. So I, I, I had the plan of wearing a camera on my shoulder while I walked down the aisle. I jokingly thought maybe I'll, I'll wear a GoPro. <laughs> um, and the conclusion was how about I rig a camera above the hookah and I'll have a remote trigger in, in my bouquet, yeah. which like oh, that's foolproof where, genius. It that, was so oh, good. I didn't realize that was where the trigger was. Oh yes. Ah. Well, oh no, no. So I, let me, let me backtrack a moment. That's where the trigger was supposed to be. Ah. And uh, just before the wedding, um, I decided that, you know what? I, I set up the shot. It's mine my picture, my vision, but I, maybe for this moment, I'll relinquish the control and hand the remote off to a friend, my assistant, if you will. So uh, I didn't have the remote in my bouquet as I had planned, but I have to tell you that, so we had two cameras, one above the tree, uh, above the huppa in the tree, one on the ground, because yeah. obviously I had to get multiple angles. Well, at one stage you're going to walk underneath the huppa, aren't you? So you'll, you'll need that shot as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everything was was synced up yeah. and uh my friend uh jessica earnshaw also a photographer was triggering the remote for me um so both cameras were firing and even though the the camera above the hoopa was firing at nothing essentially because we were we were out of view i could hear the shutter clicking <laughs> the or the mirror clicking <laughs> and um it brought me a certain satisfaction that i cannot explain <laughs> like i knew we were getting the shot please tell me that you yeah. were concentrating on your vows at the same time i was i'm, I'm multitasking queen um but it just and i think no i don't think anyone could hear it other than me but it was it was a, it was a little wedding gift uh, it was, i felt it, like it, it was, <laughs> there were some beautiful shots on that um sadly after the wedding your father goes downhill uh, reasonably yes. quickly and he does pass on the 40th anniversary of um his mum's passing. Again, there's some humour, though, isn't there? Because when you, you, you take this extraordinary picture, it's so courageous. I mean, I know he's just passed. It's a sad picture. But the story yeah. you tell of that moment is one of, well, there's some humour because <laughs> the television's flickering on and off. Yes. Um, it was so insane. We were at the hospital and, um, I mean, the hospital room had kind of become our home at this point. Yeah. And there was a TV. We didn't really watch a ton of it, but I swear in the last like hours of his life, I don't know if it's, you start hyper focusing in on the little things. Um, but you know, like the sun was setting and that was really important to my father. He loved the sunset. It just, he felt this, this, this unbelievable connection and passion for the sunset. It's just a thing. Um, and the TV, the hospital TV, it was this little, this little screen up by the ceiling kept turning on randomly. And it was turning on to football, which was like, he loved football. He loved football so much. He was buried in his favorite football jersey. And it was so, it kind of cut the tension. Yeah. You know, that moment where you're like, so like, is this really happening? I, I can't believe this is happening. Is it happening now? And then it like cuts to a broadcast of a football game and you're like, ah! <laughs> like, but then it felt so right. We're like, yeah. is he doing this somehow? Yeah. Like some magical way? I don't know. It all just felt very meant to I, I, be. And I think with the sun streaming through the window, as you say, um, and that and the, the composition, I mean, can we talk about composition and light at this particular time? I think we can. Yeah, he... Um, like I said, my father was a storyteller. So I like to think that he had some sort of control or role. A lot of my images, I feel like, are kind of quiet. That's the other thing. There was a lot of madness in the mix, but it was the quiet moments were so visceral and um, so meaningful. And I guess I look back now and my photographs, I think, speak to that. And And it was those little moments with the the sunlight streaming in and, you know, the room was quiet. You could hear the beeps of the machines, but 
everything was still and beautiful. Mm. There was, even in the hospital, there was just, there was a, there was so much beauty and um, like honor at the end of life. Yeah. And, and I, I think I never fully appreciated it until I saw it happening in front of me. But it also, my family also very much relied on, on humor yeah. and, and levity wherever we could find it in moments of deep sadness. And um, uh, I think that was sort of how we, I mean, we were very serious for that moment, but also just, I remember fondly the, all the funny moments yeah. in the mix too. And and talking of um, of quiet, um, your the final pictures of mum. That was a quiet moment as well. It was a beautifully composed quiet moment. It was just, in fact, you don't see mum's face. You see just her body. There's there's uh, her hands, and her hands are being held by I think your brother and sister. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was a different it was a different scene than when my father passed away. You know, he was at the hospital with lots of machines beeping and doctors and nurses coming and going and you know they were strangers and my mother didn't want that she said you know when I die I want to be at home in my bed in my pjs listening to James Taylor surrounded by the people I love in the world and so that's that's what we did and um I remember in those last moments of her life, and obviously we didn't know for sure, you know, if those were her last moments, but we could tell that things were sort of shutting down. And, mm. and, uh, and a strange, uh, one thing I want to know is that this was a really difficult moment, but I think I started grieving her death and, and my father's death long before they died. Mm. So I, that process of grief had already you know, planted roots. And so in these final moments, my siblings are holding her hands. And my brother, who's also a photographer, said to me, you know, are you going to shoot this moment? And it was almost like I was so transfixed and, and and lost in the moment that I forgot about my camera. But I'm so grateful that he did because I, you know, I got up on the bed. I took this photograph. I didn't even, I don't think I intentionally meant to cut off her head, but I think I, I'm, I'm glad that I did because it it was sort of like, it wasn't about, it wasn't her anymore. It was this sort of, she was this being at the end of her life and, and what we knew of her and loved about her had sort of already gone at this point. It was just nature happening. And I look down and um, take the picture. I put my camera down. It was pretty quiet in the room. And I remember looking over at my brother and looking at my sister being like, you know, are you okay? It's like, How's everyone doing? Um, And I think in that moment, uh, she stopped breathing. Mm. And, you know, to what we were talking about earlier, I think, I think you do, I think hearing is the last thing that goes. And I think she probably felt comfort hearing us say, yeah, we're okay. And then, and then the moment passed. And I just remember feeling like almost frozen, like, oh my gosh, she's gone. Mm. There was something in those last couple of weeks of her life that I think beyond photography and beyond being, you know, documenting this, I gave all of us a certain sense of purpose to care for her. And, and yes, maybe she couldn't walk anymore, but she could still eat. And maybe she couldn't eat anymore, but she could still laugh and listen to music. And, and like, and you just start to shift um, your priorities and your perspective and, and just, it all built to this moment. Do you think looking back um, at, at this incredible story that you might have approached it differently in any way at all? Or, or do you think, you know what, Nancy? I got this. That was absolutely fine. And I'm sure they'd have said, you nailed that, Nancy. Well done. There were moments um, early on where I felt like what if I'm going to miss something important? What if I'm so close to my story, so close to this story that I'm not going to see something that's important and relevant, you know, thinking like a photographer. And fortunately for me, there were so many people, especially photographers who reached out to say, I wish I had done X and I wish I had done Y. And I wish I had asked these questions. I wish I had shot certain things. And I, I feel like that was really a gift a very generous gift from so many, because then 
I spent those two years photographing my parents kind of with the knowledge from other people reminding me to do certain things or to think about things or to ask certain questions and not get in my own way and, and just do it. So I don't have a ton of regrets. I look back at the work and I'm like pretty happy about it because largely because so many people kind of were there sharing their regrets with me. If I could change one thing and it's, I'm a crazy person, but photographers I think will relate. (laughs) It will be that when my mother died, I knew that I needed to take a photograph um, in the temple that sort of mirrored the image from my father's funeral. Mm. I felt like I needed an image that represented not only honored her in the same way that I honored him, but um, I needed something that represented what I was feeling, which was sort of this deja vu. We were there exactly a year ago burying my father and here we were burying my mother and i i remembered the framing i got on the stage where the podium was i gave my eulogy i stepped aside i put the camera up to my face i took four frames five frames and then that was it um and i i didn't look at them until later of course then later i pulled them up on my screen side by side only to realize that I think it was my father's funeral. I maybe got a little lower. So the perspective is not exact. And it's rare that you'll see those images side by side, but I'll always remember that they were not exactly the same. (laughs) And it kind of, kind of drives me crazy. (laughs) Uh, Only a photographer, Nancy, only a photographer. Um, What was the song? What was the James Taylor? You said your mum was a James Taylor fan. What, what was the song that was playing in the room from James Taylor that day? It was um, Up on the Roof. <sighs> do you know that song? I do. I do. We we played it <laughs> on repeat. And now, oh my gosh, I, get, I mean, I haven't thought about that song in a while, but it's kind of making me a little emotional. Um, I feel like I was in a store and I heard it and I just started breaking down in tears Um, because it just it felt like her it felt like she was kind of talking to me and and kind of winking at me Um, yeah my thanks to Nancy Borowick and links to her work and the family imprint will be on the show page today and that's it keep sending your questions in or feedback to studio at photographydaily.show so that I can feature you in the mailbag edition, which is in a couple of days' time, the Friday photo walk, as we we grab our cameras and uh, set out together. Next week's guest list includes Pete Souza, eight years photographing and documenting the everyday life at home, on tour, state visits, and those moments of one President Barack Obama. Yeah, I had um, the highest security clearance, uh, top secret SCI, it's called. Uh, so that I could be in the room when they were discussing uh, sensitive uh, topics. I didn't ever uh, uh, set up or direct a- anything, mm. um, but obviously I made his official portrait. We were not allowed to delete any photographs at all. So all of my photographs uh, are now at our National Archives. Pete Souza with us next week. Music in the show today was from artlist.io and I look forward to photographing with you, hearing from you and talking with you on Friday as we walk and make pictures on the Photo Walk, our mailbag show of the week. Photography Daily is a Loading Zone production.